Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Let's start our video with a story from a contractor who told it to our OP. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Contractor versus the Landfill My contractor just told me this story, so I thought I'd share it with you folks. We're in the process of redoing multiple parts of our yard because someone in the past decided lots of wood decks, wood fences, and wood retaining walls were the way to go. The termites have been very happy with their decision. We've been reusing what wood we can, but a lot of it's just falling apart. Today, our contract went to take all the treated wood to the landfill, filled out the necessary paperwork, paid the necessary amount, and was told to go up to six, and there's a specific blue bin for the treated lumber. He goes up thinking there was a large dumpster and is presented with a bin slightly smaller than the back of his truck. He looks at the trailer stacked with wood, looks at the bin, looks at the guy, and tells him it's not going to all fit. He can stack it next to the bin, but there's just way too much. Landfill employee says it all has to be in the bin. So my lovely contractor puts four of the longest boards in all the corners and proceeds to stack them. At one point, climbing on top of the truck to continue stacking them. End result was about the height of a one-story house. The employee comes back yelling about how he couldn't do that. Alas, all he said was it had to be in the bin. And in the bin it was. And our second story. You want to share all my private information with friends and family? Okay. So here it goes. I met this girl in January of this year. We hit it off and got along great and everything seemed peachy. Fast forward a few months, and the true nature of her being comes out. She starts flipping out at me for hanging out with my other friends even once a week. She refused to allow me to have any time at all for myself. She starts saying very mean things about quite a lot of people, and to top it all off, she was a smoker and an alcoholic, both things she lied about. Because I've had trials and tribulations with those things in the past and don't want to be around people like that. And she knew this. To top it all off, she was extremely rude to damn near everyone, and I was trapped because no one wanted to see her, but they wanted to see me, and I had to choose between her wrath for chilling with people or sit there in agony as she gets effed up and says terrible things about people I care about. I don't enjoy the company of people that are mean for no good reason like that at all, and I decided that it'd be much better for me to just be single because I didn't want to run the risk of her negativity bleeding into me. Needless to say, she did not take that well. I had an account on her Mac that I used occasionally, and she knew the password. Here's where things get effy. Since she knew the password on my account, the day after we split, she went on it and started sending very lewd messages to everyone that was in my contacts, including my mom and dad. Those were awkward conversations, believe me, because she had access to everything on my phone. I knew what she was doing, so I went into my account and booted her computer off at ASAP, because that's just not right. This was two weeks ago. About 30 minutes ago, I noticed more texts being sent on my behalf, and these are even worse than before. At this point, all my friends knew what kind of person she is, because they all know me well enough to know I wouldn't do or say anything even close to what she was sending. I changed my password as well, but she had access to the app I used to manage my passwords and use the new one to log back in. At this point, I'm fuming. She's blatantly disregarding my privacy and just trying to ruin my relationships with everyone I care about, so I decide enough is enough. I went on find my iPhone and located her Mac because she'd signed back into my iCloud account. I notice a button that says Erase Mac. When I saw this, my heart fluttered because I finally saw a way to end the madness. Basically, I wiped the entire computer of all its data and also put a passcode on it so she can't even get back into her bricked computer until she contacts me for it. Now she's stuck with a very expensive paperweight, and I can rest easy because she can no longer try to wreak havoc with my relationships or have access to my private information and passwords. I've never done anything like this to someone, and I can't help but feel that I'm going to get some form of karmic payback for it but damn, does it feel good to finally get back at her for what she did. And then some. And our next story. You bump into me and want me to apologize? 
As I had just missed my selected mode of public transport, I was naturally the first and only person in the queue. Patiently, I waited for the next one to arrive and people began to gather around me. It's the rush hour and everyone's eager to get on to get places. Generally speaking, I have no problem if people want to push in front of me. I get to stay near the doors with fewer people invading my space and, more importantly, when the doors open at the next stop, I get some air from the scent of oud a mass of sweaty people at 8 a.m. But today's different. I've had problems with my knees recently, which makes it difficult for me to walk long distances or to stand for prolonged periods of time. So today, I want to see GD it. No commuter was going to push in front of me unless they were elderly, disabled, pregnant, or had a child with them. So I stood there, my vehicle of transportation approaching. I'm half aware of my surroundings and half reading my book. Out of the corner of my eye, I spy a lady with a buggy making a beeline for the front of the queue ahead of me. Fine, I don't mind one person with a child going in first. She'll just clear the way for me to get on and I'll get a seat. No, no, this buggy bee has other ideas. She walks behind me and decidedly rams her effing buggy into my ankles. It's too warm and I'm too tired to start a disagreement with a lady with a child, as I'll invariably lose. Who argues with a mother at 8 a.m.? I turn with a polite smile and am just about to utter the words, I get to start the short hissing of sorry, when what do I hear from the buggy bee's cavernous mouthpiece? Effing hell, can't you stand properly? Can't you see I've got a child? I'm all astonishment. I can see people glaring at me. I can see the one thought running through all their minds. How rude. That person's trying to push in front of a lady with a buggy. You know what? It's not worth it. I'm too tired. I've been working long hours, of which my overtime is completely unpaid. I do it for the love of my job, but GD, I need a higher salary. I stand there as our transportation arrives. It stops. Doors open. I get the F on. Yeah, B, did you see that? I effing got on without offering to let you on first. I even released a noxious bomb for you to walk through as I enjoyed being the first person at the stop to step through the doors once people had disembarked. And you know what? I savored every moment of sitting in the last available seat. You can effing stand over there, sweating with people breathing down your neck and your bratty child screaming that people are getting too close to it. And our last story. A sleepy trucker versus two drunks. So last Thursday night, I stopped my truck in Raleigh to get a hotel. I checked into room 410 around 7 p.m., had been driving and unloading glass since 6 a.m. I'd finished all my stops and was going to wake up at 5 a.m. and drive home, set my alarm for 4.45 a.m. But then, right at 4 a.m., two drunk SOBs came barging loudly down the hallway outside my room. I glanced at the clock and yelled through the door to kindly STFU. <laughs> what was that? Ha. Huh. I could hear them exchange. I looked through the peephole and watched them disappear into room 409, directly across the hall from mine, as they completely disregarded the newfound knowledge that other people do exist inside this hotel. Great. The hotel had nearly booked up this night, so I know I wasn't the only one getting a rude awakening. I quickly gave up on the fantasy of sleeping for another hour and got dressed and packed. The drunken dialogue grew louder from across the hall, absolutely unaware they were disturbing me and everyone else on the fourth floor in the Holiday Inn, they loudly told each other about all the unmentionable things they wanted to do with the female companions with whom they probably annoyed enough to bail on them. I finally picked up the phone and dialed the front desk. It rang once, twice, twenty times. Great. At least someone was getting some sleep. I finally gave up and placed the phone back on the receiver. As I did, I glanced at the instructions printed on the phone. Room to room, dial 7 plus room number. I wasted no time. 7409. Uh, hello? My first instinct was to curse and raise hell, but something quickly came over me and I began faking an Indian accent. Hello, sir. We've received multiple complaints about the noise coming from your room. I honestly have no idea why I started speaking with a Middle Eastern accent, maybe just because I associate it with hotel attendants from all the ones I've stayed in recently, but the accent was flowing nicely and I decided to go with it. He actually sounded surprised. No, no, sir, that couldn't, that's not us, we were asleep. No, I quickly cut him off. A guest says he watched you walk into room 409 and five more of my guests have called the front desk. My fake accent was becoming very irate and sounded better than ever. I'm sorry, sir, we didn't realize 
You've woken up every guest on that floor. Six customers call, say you wake them. Really, we didn't mean you have one hour to leave my hotel. I give you one hour to get your things, and then I call the police. Oh, sir, I'm sorry. Really, won't happen again. I can hear them through the door at this point. Please, just one more chance. This is not up for negotiation, sir. My customers are having to get up to go to work, and you've woken them all. You have one hour. The grin that covered my face as I hung up must have been the complete opposite of what I'd been feeling a mere two minutes earlier, and it took restraint not to burst out in laughter. From across the hall, I could hear loud, nervous whispering as they frantically tried to figure out where they were going to go. I grabbed my bag and walked out my door, being sure to move slowly past their door so I could listen very closely to the nervous, regretful whispers they were now exchanging. I finally did laugh when the elevator door shut. Oh man, I thought, I got them good. On the way through the lobby, I rang the bell on the desk to get the attention of my newly awoken attendant. Buddy, you might want to do something about those drunk bee turds that just woke up everybody on the fourth floor on their way into room 409. I was planning on sleeping for another hour or two, and I know I can't be the only one they woke up with their screaming. He looked pretty PO'd when he learned of this, but at least he wasn't going to kick them out. I guess. Anyway, that's exactly how it went down, and that's why I laughed all the way through Raleigh at 4.30 a.m. in my glass truck. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.